it's the gigging and the touring and seeing them live, which is where the scooters come into their own, really. It, it's their lifeblood. I mean, you see the band live on stage, and that is where they're at home. They're a fantastic live band. If you say to any band, do you want to go on tour in the States, promote your album, then they're not going to say no. This was our big chance, really, wouldn't it? Like, yeah. yeah. It's quite an audacious task, really, for five guys from Cardiff to say, right, oh, we're just going to pop over and crack the States in a couple of minutes. When you think about how much it takes to break America, it's like breaking Britain 51 times over. Three of us met in St. David's College in Cardiff. My first impression of Anthony is in the, was it the common room? Being surrounded by about six girls. I think he was singing show tunes or something. <laughs> you said that! <laughs> you said a liar! Show what was he singing? He was singing, was singing, life, singing, life, as a, he was singing life as a Cabaret. <laughs> and um, we just looked at him and thought, we're not going to get on with him, he's like right Nancy Boyd. But uh, we were wrong. In sixth form, we used to have these, we thought we were a bit entrepreneurs, so we used to decide to put on these rock nights once a year. I think, mean, what was the first one called? Jungle Rock. Jungle Rock. Mm -hmm. Just a money-making thing for us, really, because we were the skin at the time. So we thought, right, if we're going to have a concert, we want a headline, but we didn't have a band. So what was the first one? Liquid Bacon. That was, was our first, first band for Jungle Rock, and then the next mm. year was uh, Don't, Don't Eat the salad. salad. Urban Rock. This is, this is sounded like Spinal Tap now. We were 17, 18, we got this massive soul band together and um, we used to do about five, four or five gigs a week. And we were like the richest teenagers in Cardiff, we must have been. Tim used to drive the van, but he was always, but he was, Tim was always like tapping along with everything and you know, he was definitely a frustrated drummer. So I said, look, just buy a drum kit and we'll, you know, we'll have it just as a laugh, we'll, you know, try and... I don't even know if we said buy a drum kit, I think he was just tapping away one day when we slipped one underneath. <laughs> We started playing around with it. There you just go, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Slowly beginning. turned into, into the scooters. But it wasn't the scooters at first, was it? No, it was Father Mackenzie. Father first. Mackenzie. Father Mackenzie. Mackenzie. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I was playing with the journeyman. <laughs> Hang on. Going far too spinal tap. We were doing cover versions and we were... Yeah. We were absolutely rubbish at cover versions. Yeah. Mm. And everybody would say we'd slip in like, you know, four or five of our ones and they'd say, you might as well just stick to your own sense <laughs> because you can't play covers for, for love nor money. And it was, um, I think that's why we started to think, well, you know, if people are enjoying our songs just as much as our bad cover versions. Yeah, we might as well just go. Cool. And we thought, oh, well, you know, perhaps we are, perhaps we are doing something right. Take this a little bit more seriously yeah. and when try and get on a bit. Gigs in and London as well. Gigs in London, and, and then you think, well, yeah, we're, you know, we're something good here. When we first started, then yeah, you have all these um, ideals of. I want to make it to the top, or I want, I want to make a lot of money from this, I want to be touring, I want this to be my job. But then, um, <clears throat> as you gradually go through it, you, you understand it's just not like that. You know, it, yeah, it happens for many bands, and they get lucky if you like, they're in the right place at the right time, but 90% of the, of the bands that, that are around, it's a struggle. So we learned that quite at an early stage, it's definitely not handed to you on a plate. You've got to work for it. When it seriously, we seriously thought about doing it properly was when we had the opportunity to go to America for the first time yeah. and play over there. That's when, you know, we thought, you don't get a chance like this very often. Let's grab it with both hands and just go for it. I think Americans really took them to heart. I mean, the, the sort of melodies, the lyrics, the whole on-stage thing, they, you know, they, they would have gone down well over there, the whole West Coast sort of feel. And I think in a way, maybe uh, America was quicker to, to take them under their wing than, than we have been over here. There's a snobbishness about the, uh, an indie sort of snobbishness 
in the British uh, in the British music industry, um, which doesn't exist over in America. In America, they do tend to have this, you know, they whoop and they go, "This music's great," and they just go for it. People are very much into being entertained, and the Scooters are a really entertaining band to go and see. There was a huge kind of sense of optimism and excitement over there. We were getting. Good reviews. Yeah. We were getting played on the radio too. And, and we were getting radio play, yeah, and, and really good reviews. And and we we sort of started buying into that. We just found that much more encouraging. The idea to do the tour in April was to promote the album that we'd recorded the previous August, which was called I Can See a House From Here. The album that helped as well, went yeah. straight into the college radio chart number 65, which is pretty high for an unknown band from from Wales. We were getting loads of spins on um, college radio then, so it was definitely like strike while the iron's hot sort of thing, you know. We're just getting ready now to go fly to New York to start our tour for 2002 of America. Feeling quite apprehensive, a little bit nervous, a little bit excited. I think we're, we're there the first 11 days, we're working constantly every night, so yeah, I'm just looking forward to the, uh, the whole busy agenda. 31 states in how many days? Five, right? Pretty daunting, but I'm sure uh, I'm sure we can do it. Uh, hopefully, we'll speak to you when we get to New York. See you then. We got to the airport and uh, we said, right, just act calmly. We've got a lot of equipment with us, just while straight through. And um, they, <laughs> we had a plan. We said the usual plan is that we're going to a wedding. We've been to about seven weddings now in America because we're not meant to to work. We get to um, customs. Yeah, we're off to a wedding. Fine, sir. Pass. Anthony went through, Tim went through, Simon went through, and it comes to Bob, and um, he just froze, didn't he? He just panicked and thought for about five minutes and said, uh, what did he say? I think he said, we're doing gigs, but we're not getting paid for them. But Bob told him we were just recording in Los Angeles. <laughs> so this, this customs officer, with a gun, I might add, um, is, you know, he's perplexed at, this, at Bob's sort of, you know, yeah, why are you in New York then, sir, if you're recording in Los Angeles? So Bob, you know, he just lost it then. Lost the plot completely. <laughs> oh yeah, um, what what happened in the airport, Bob? I was strip searched and I had the rubber glove treatment. Ooh, but he enjoyed it. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> they used plenty of KY. So I'm walking like this now. <laughs> Bob always walks. Like that. <laughs> so we're looking around. We're saying, "Excuse me, where do, where do all the uh, fragile equipment come through?" He said, "Oh, it's over there somewhere." And in the background, so we could do looking. Yeah, ba-doom, oh, ba-doom, ba-doom, ba-doom. and they chucked our ampli- <laughs> our amplifiers. Where you put your suitcases, and they were all rolling, rolling down no, the, the, carousel. the carousel. We were all going, ah! Well, I wasn't there at the time because I was being interrogated by the customs, but I'd been told that no fragile stickers were put on any of the guitars, amps, keyboards, or anything, or the luggage for that matter. And it was just thrown down the terminal chute, and um, some of it took a right old battering. We've got, tra- you know, trolleys and trolleys of amps and. And God knows what. Purpose of your visit? Uh, Just <laughs> shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Another wedding. And now, what do we need? We need the. Uh... <laughs> yeah, Bob. <laughs> did take, the, did video take camera. the video camera. Yeah. We'd wanted to record it. Because we That's thought if this never came to anything, we, w- we may never get another chance to go all the way around America. Van out, it was an 18-seater van, and because we had all our gear with us, we had to take the two, two back seats out <clears throat> to fit all our amps and guitars in. Then um, we realised we were going to be leaving the van out quite a lot overnight when we were in hotels, so we had to black out um, the windows at the back. We found a lot of cardboard boxes on the, on the street, so <laughs> we're cutting up cardboard boxes in the shape of the windows and sticking them on with, in the middle of Masking. the Bronx or wherever we were. It worked, because nothing got nicked. Sorry? Brought to New Jersey to do a radio show. So, um, because of the tight schedule, <laughs> you can say. Um, We've just no. dropped off the gear at the, uh, the club, the uh, Mercury, Mercury, Mercury Lounge. Lounge. Oh, so now we're going to rush over to New Jersey and then uh, we'll probably do a couple of songs on the radio. Over there, the college radio um, 
you know, structure is so important. It makes or breaks bands, you know what I mean? In America, the College Broadcast Network, or um, CMJ as, it, as it's called, that is the biggest thing to break into for a band on the independent. It's, a, it, it's those radio stations that broke the likes of R.E.M. and broke the likes of Coldplay to the American audience. All right, it's uh, WCLY and the Wellesley 91.5 FM. I'm Molly, your host, here with the Scooters. Hello. 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 Hello, everyone. We knew we had a decent album in, in the bag, and we just needed to bolster our, you know, sort of stature on the college radio Keeping circuit, the momentum really. going, wasn't Keeping it? Keeping the really? momentum going, yeah. Right, I'm on the phone now. I've got one minute left before I talk to this guy, Joe, from WBNY in Buffalo. Live? Yeah, live. <laughs> We're from um, Wales. Do you know where Wales is? Yeah, so it's kind of like the, the, the small bit on the left of England, like, you know, so in between Ireland and England. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's where we're from, yeah. And you're listening to 341919 WNTI, FM radio in Pakistan, New Jersey. I have five guys from Wales here. The scooters, yay. We picked up the, the, the van in New York and we'd had, we've got like a 13,000 mile journey to do, which is the equivalent really of driving from London to Sydney. I was conscious of it was such a big trip. I'm like, I remember being in work about two weeks before and so we start there and we go sort of halfway through America and we drop down to Texas, back up and back around again. And it was like day after day after day and I thought, man, that's ahead of a schedule. Man. We knew what gigs we had. We knew we had 26, 27 gigs. Um, we knew what order we were going to do them in. Because we're only with a, an independent uh, record label over there as well, everything's done on a on tiny budget. You know, even though they provided like um, the van and, and the hotels, we'd have to, you know, cover the food and, and whatever to, just through, you know, gigging money. When you play these clubs, <coughs> they give you like a percentage of the door take. Mm. If you're like higher up on the bill, you'll get a bigger split on the door. Mm. And then, um, and then you've got to work on your merchandise to try and cover your costs. So, like, yeah, sort of it, was, it, was, it was a game playing, really, because if you were later on the bill, like higher up on the bill, then there were more people seeing you, so it's more likely to sell CDs, and therefore we'd have enough to get us to the next place. But that that gave us the sense of a mission, though, because we couldn't afford to miss a gig. How much pressure can we take? You want that? <laughs> we're doing it for the music, not for the women, not for the styles. No. Okay then. I'm doing it for the women. <laughs> Last night we played the Mercury Lounge in New York, and um, uh, it was it was all right. Uh, Tony decided to do some free fall jazz and playing a completely different key to everybody else, <laughs> which um, was kind of scary because we all thought our machines. Any our comments, Tom? I had it all under control. <laughs> I knew what I was doing. I was just trying something a little bit new. <laughs> trying to yeah, trying to mix it up a little bit. Your cap on the wrong fret. The fourth fret. Yeah. So yeah. And um, no, I think it was good. It was a bit slapdash because there were four bands and there was a lot to, a lot of equipment flying about. But we met up with. It was like a bring and buy sale, wasn't it? <laughs> it was a bring and buy sale. Okay, I, I was, Charge for Africa! I was, uh, I was a little stressed by the end. Well, I suppose it's like with any tour, no matter which band you're in, you spend a lot of time you know, doing the same sort of things. It was always like hotel, van, gig, van, hotel. You know, we had to fit five people into like two rooms or one room on certain nights. Okay, here we are, sneaking into the hotel, again. We'd usually either find that there was a back door and smuggle some of the other guys in, or because we were all wearing the same gear, we'd, we'd, just, we'd just run we past the blur. The so, <laughs> just a blur of black and Adidas <laughs> trainers. Uh, yeah. Stay back. Me and Bob are going to stay back because we're sneaking into the hotel. We're in bed. You've got to get some sleep because you've got to drive them for another nine hours to get to the next place, like you know. So you've got to work it sort of regimentally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 There's this woman who's famous in the 60s for basically making plastic hats of rock stars' dicks. And she she said that Jimi Hendrix's um, dick was the was the penis de Milo. And the best rock stars knob she'd ever seen. And apparently she was there last night. But um She didn't know she didn't have enough plaster <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to take the scooters to on. Take the scooters on. So um she did it with mashed potato instead. But uh, we Bob at it, <laughs> being the fat kid he is. <laughs> Bob at my mashed potato knob. There you go. It's on tape. So this is Kentucky now. Which is where we're playing tonight in a place called uh, Southgate House, which is actually the DSS office buildings in Cardiff as well. <laughs> so it's quite apt, really. When you go to a gig in America, you'll often hear a hushed audience while, while, while you're playing. People are there to listen to the music and to, and, to, and to really get into the skin of that. They're not so obsessed with image and, and things of that nature. It's about the music. We didn't really know what to expect, like, you know. And then when we actually started going around, we saw, saw the level of the bands that were playing around these clubs. There were some seriously good bands playing, like, you know. That did actually make you raise your game, sort of subconsciously anyway, you know. When you put upon a poster, directly from the UK, the scooters. The scooter, you know, it's going to be exotic, it's going to attract people along, it's not going to be their standard bar room band. If you go out there with good songs and a good act, then people will, will take to you. And I think that maybe that's where the scooters have, have played to their strengths. They're a, you know, they're a, they're a good bunch of musicians, they've got good material, they've got a really uh, exciting stage presence, and I think maybe American audiences responded to that. I was amazed about the amount of people who just, especially in America, the bands we were with, they were like, where did you guys learn to sing like that? I love the fact those options are open to us where we don't have to have a drum kit and loads of amps and whatever. We can just go in, someone hand us a guitar and entertain people, like, you know.
Simon, what he is today, he's a bit of like a karate kid. If we, like the four of us are sort of collectively like Mr. Miyagi, <laughs> go with me on this. I'm with you. And he's like obviously Daniel's son. So um, he picks his target at the beginning yeah. of the, before a gig. Uh, so hello. Let's go over and, and have a chat. See, uh, see how the lovers are getting on. And then he's playing on stage, and he gets eye contact, but he waits to, to his big solo. And how's things going? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I've been some lovely people like Eric here. So that's like Danielson doing the crab. <laughs> that's him doing his solo. <laughs> but he never takes his eyes off her. And he's, doing, he's doing all that. And then he comes off stage and then we don't see him until the next morning. People of Great Britain! Mr. Spoons! Take a bow, Mr. Spoons! Take a bow! This guy makes like a beeline for me. I'm like, hey mate, how's it going? And he's like, ah, I'm Mr. Spoons. And I played the spoons. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yes! He had like two teeth, like there. I want you to show me now your favorite spoon's move. Okay. Did he smell? I can't remember. Did oh, he smell definitely, the definitely smelled the weed. I can't remember if he smelled the weed. Or Sugar puffs. He, he was quite dirty. He was a lovely man. Those spoons are on fire! We could have her, you know, we could have her. But we'll let Simon have her. We could blow the bear. Because he's a keyboard player, he doesn't get many styles, so we'll leave him alone. We were also then performing in the bar after the shows because we really wanted to sell CDs, but we really wanted to win people over. So even after a full on show, we'd. we'd We'd be jamming in there or, or singing around an acoustic guitar in a bar. I was a bit like Blair Witch. If you find this camera in uh, six months' time, make a good movie out of it. Which, if you find this camera in uh, six months' time, make a good movie out of it. It's quite an audacious task, really, for five guys from CAD to say, right, we're just going to pop over and crack the seats in a couple of months. How much pressure can we take in one day? <laughs> if you say to any band, do you want to go on tour in the States, promote your album, then they're not going to say no. This was our big was chance, really, wasn't it? Like, yeah. yeah. I was amazed about the amount of people who just, especially in America, the bands we were with, they were like, where did you guys learn to sing like that? I love the fact those options are open to us, where we don't have to have a drum kit and loads of amps and whatever. We can just go in, someone hand us a guitar, and entertain people, like, you know? i 
seem to get much better Don't care if I get nowhere I don't care for loving I don't care at all All I need is nothing I don't care at all I don't care at all so This is quite a big deal for us, we were doing six weeks um, traveling in a van, mainly driving ourselves all across America, pretty much um, 13 and a half thousand miles, I think. In America, the roads, they're just straight and they're pretty much the same. It's not like landmarks in, in say, you drive from Cardiff to London, you can sort of gauge from, from the landmarks how far you've gone. Yeah. You've got no idea when you're driving in America, so you think, oh, I'm a bit tired now, how far have I gone? And you've driven about 16 hours or something. I mean, there were times when we weren't eating, we were just drinking coffee and, and very little sleep, and we were going through some mad cabin fever moments. OK, we're bored, so we're teaching Bob to go, uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Come on, Bob. You can do it. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, really? To be able to live with each other is one of the hardest things. You're living in each other's pockets for that period of time. Oh. <laughs> you need to be able to go without sleep, sometimes without food for a period of time. Hey, we haven't eaten for 27 hours. Bob's and we're all pretty look hungry. Look how thin Bob's looking. And handle the long driving conditions. I mean, in talking to the band, the distances they were covering uh, were immense. The biggest drive we had was Minneapolis, Minneapolis to Missoula, Missoula, through the Rockies, and that was at night and it was snowing. We went through um, Fargo. Fargo and all those places where it was blizzard, and there's literally trucks doing about 90 kilometers past us, and there's cars spinning off the road in front of us into ditches, and it was yeah. just a nightmare. Doing some makeshift maintenance on the wheel arches, because it's chock-a-block with ice. Um, well, here we are, um, in the snow. Um, look at the van, man. I know. This is pretty crazy. We've just been told that um, we should clear in the next two hours on our way to, uh, well, when we get past Fargo, but uh, it's still pretty bleak here. I just remember being sat in the back of the van when you were driving in, in the Rockies, and there's ice forming on the inside of the, of the window. And that's when I thought, oh, hang on. Simon is just not petrol station enough whatsoever. Shut up, Bob. <laughs> we're in North Dakota. And we're on our way to We're Missoula. on our way to Missoula, which is about another 500 miles. Yeah. I think it's a bit more than that. I think we're just about halfway from where we set off, which was um, Minneapolis. It's about another 800 miles then. Yeah, anyway, I'm going back in the van, it's freezing. Yeah, it's it's very cold. cold. The Missoula drive was the heating had to be on all the time, and we just got stuffy, and we started to, to drop off now and again. And it wasn't good. We're in Montana, in the Rocky Mountain region. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> well worth the... Uh, well worth the 21-hour drive we've had to get here. I remember getting to Missoula and I think we got there about midday. Okay, we're in Missoula, that's where we're playing tonight. Jay's upstairs. I suppose that's upstairs. In this beautiful setting in Missoula. Look at that. I think the boys are just going to check it out. Didn't want to speak to anyone. We just <laughs> just went straight to bed. Straight to bed. <laughs> then woke up for a gig in the night and we were fine then mm. after a few shots of whatever that thing he was giving us was. So introduce yourself, Carl. Uh, Colin Hickey, Missoula, Montana, Jay's upstairs. I'll be your bartender tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Oh, it's gonna be a nice one. Gonna be a long night. So what's Missoula like? Cold, lots of hippies. 
<laughs> That's about it. <laughs> that Sounds like the Royal Oak. This is probably one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life. Uh, we're just on our way to Seattle and we came across a casino in the middle of nowhere by here, which also does breakfast, which was fantastic. I don't think you can generalize like a, a nation, but definitely the more inland you go, uh, um, the, the more heads they get. The, <laughs> the stranger people get, definitely. They, like I was, Our friends are like either from the East Coast or the West Coast, all the people we know really well in the States. And even they are kind of weary about traveling in inland kind of thing. <laughs> I'm so excited. Denny's, look, it's like the best, the best breakfast in uh, America. We're gonna have dagwood, 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 dagwood. Okay, we're in Denny's. Check out, check out the freaks working in this place. Oh my god, he's mental. <laughs> oh, he's not cooking my dagwood. <laughs> it's like the uglier younger son of Tom Selleck. He looks like a scene Tim with a tap. Would you let this man cook your food? Oh god, there's another one, look at this one. Psycho killer. Qu'est-ce <laughs> Didn't get my dagwood. So, um, just as well, because I think we were taking the piss out of them too much. Someone they were going to crack one off in the sausages or the eggs. Or... Do something nasty. Where are we going now? So we're gonna find a. Oh, killers! Oh my God! Check him out behind. <laughs> right. We just gone to this Hicksville town and um, Bob got naked, but accidentally he didn't mean to. But his clothes just fell off. <laughs> Hicksville. It's a Tuesday night. Weird audience. Here. Well. Weird audience. Nice guy on the door. I thought we played quite well tonight. I thought we did go okay tonight, but play with a band called 34 Satellite. Who are, who are quite poo. Only two well, it's CDs. Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. And it's Kansas City. That's oh, cool. Well, never mind. Okay, we're going to go back in and drink more beer now. Bye. See you later. Bye. You have to have a massive belief because you don't know what's going to be at the end of each, you know, each each length of the road. You know, you'd be getting off the bus and walking into a venue. It could be anything. We had to cover so much ground. Mm. It's such a short space of time. <clears throat> going from place to place, the, you know, you were really looking forward to getting to the next place as well, do you know what I mean? Because you're going to a new climate and all in the space of like a, f a few hours. Like, even though it, it was tiring and it didn't seem like it then when you, we were doing it because it was just so much fun because we were like sort of, oh, wow, we're on our way to San Francisco. San Francisco, beautiful day. Um, we have our trials over here, and the boat to the bay, and then we've got the Golden Gate, Gate Bridge, Bridge there. So here we are at our favourite uh, Welsh pub in San Francisco, owned by Titch Jones, who hails from Kevin Coy, near Merthyr. San Francisco, Scooter Sutel, absolute murder. Every time we go back, we go and stay with him, he puts us up. Um, but he puts up super furry animals, he puts up Reese Evans. Fantastic little pub. A little bit of wheels in, in San Francisco. God bless. <laughs> Thanks, Tess. Maybe there's a 
is our time. Probably when we got to uh, Los Angeles, it was at a point of the tour when we needed a much, it was a much needed sort of ego boost. Um, and just, just need our friends around us to say, come on, you, you know, you're all right, you can push on, you can like halfway through a marathon or something like that, you know? So that was much needed for me and it was good. We had about four days there, I think, just to chill out and go to some parties and see our friends and recharge the batteries, really. Yeah. Tig and Nigga are like some of our oldest friends in LA. Say hi. Hi. Hello. Do we think they're real, though? What do you think, boys? Are they LA breasts or are they, are they real breasts? We'll, we'll find out. We'll do a test. Oh. She gets back. Actually, like JJ Williams or Gareth Edwards at the end of a game saying he's sad. The boys come out, they did, they played a blinding game today. Over the moon you know, where they are. Very proud. Let's do the test. Uh, we burn them. <laughs> melt. <laughs> ah, so if they melt, then they melt. If okay. they float, they're real. Yeah. <laughs> they the sink, they're sink, real. they're really real. Yeah. Good luck for the rest of it. Thanks, Up guys. Good luck. If we were gigging on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, you're guaranteed a really good crowd. Yeah, and I think we, you know, when we had a good crowd and we could work them, yeah, the gigs went really, really well. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, the, fun the fun bit about it. Yeah. Driving and travelling isn't so much fun, it's the actual life thing is what yeah. we want to do. You can't be it's making now. people smile. smile. Yeah. When you're in the middle of nowhere, miles from home, and, and you're doing a gig and someone shouts out, play whatever, one of our songs, and we're like, where, where the hell did that come from? That's nice though, it makes it all worthwhile, and you think, oh, perhaps we are doing the right thing, you know, perhaps people are getting to listen to our music. We got reviews for every, pretty much every town we played in, in the local papers or the college papers. Um, and I, pretty much every single one of them was, was what I'd call a good, a, a good review, if not a glowing review. We did 26 gigs in the duration of the tour and by the end of it, we were really kicking. It's a really good feeling when you get down to do the last couple of days because you know you're firing on all the cylinders and you're not making any sort of, it's only mistakes that you really know as a, as a player, like in the band. But you know you're on, you know, you know you're on fire. Like. We just finished uh, probably the best show of the tour in uh, Spaceland in Silver Lake. This girl from Phoenix has just flown from um, Put Phoenix, this money in <laughs> to Los Angeles to see our <laughs> show tonight in, oh. in Spaceland. Uh, so now Simon, not content you guys with already one hole like in to, uh, um, Cincinnati, <laughs> has got to go with this other lunatic as well. He's not talking well. about golf, ladies and gentlemen. Desert, in case you haven't noticed, somewhere um, just outside Palm Springs, is it? It's it. We're right in the middle of rattlesnake country now. Sit up all night to wait for morning light. That was a beautiful drive in a cactuses and Joshua Tree. Territory and all that. Yeah. Well, it was a total opposite to the Minnesota to Missoula drive, as in it was the same distance, but the weather was like more tropical as opposed to Arctic. Yeah. And the, the amount of water you had to take on was, it was like running a marathon. In Arizona to Memphis yeah. was five states in one night. That was crazy. So we've been on the road now for 17 hours, travelling from Phoenix to Memphis. Um, it's April Fool's Day. It's half five in the morning. Me and Tim have been sharing the drive and everyone else is asleep. Oh no, Bob's just woken up. Simon's awake. We just thought we'd take the opportunity to film the uh, sunrise for all our friends back home. We don't usually see the sun coming up. Uh, not sober anyway. Do you like this one? Just as we come over this hill.
That's Elvis's plane. The Lisa Marie. Thank you very much. Nothing really changed in, in the style of the van. It just got smellier and dirtier. And Coffee cups with cigarette butts oh. in, filled up to there. Um, burgers, donuts. Lots of tapes and CDs that other fans gave us. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere. Picked up a lot of freebies from, from all the other bands, so a stack of CDs about that big that we never listened to. <laughs> no. They say, oh, I really like your band. Do you want to swap a CD? We've got our new demo out. And we're like, well, not really, because we need to sell these to, to get to eat. But we end up swapping in here. Yeah. We started selling their CD. This is what we used to be called. <laughs> very, very rare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was Philadelphia born and raised in the playground? Most my days. Home of Will Smith and soft cheese. See you, Philly. The reaction was really, really great. Uh, in the last few shows, Philadelphia and New York. Great packed houses, brilliant gigs. So we, yeah, we were, you know, tired, but coming home like really proud of ourselves. By the time it finished and we got to, to um, back to JFK, we were exhausted. Um, partly thinking, all right, I, I just can't wait to get home and, and get to bed for a week. Mm. Partly, did we do that? What just happened in the last six and a half weeks? Did we really travel 13 and a half thousand miles? And, um, and partly I want to do it all again. The fact that we did it, you know, I, and on, our, on, a, on the shoestring that we did it, and it seemed su such a massive task that we, we were presented with. And it was like sort of, yeah, yeah, we're going to, you know, we, yeah, of course we're going to do it. And, and we did. Had we not played um, out there, you know, played live, the album wouldn't have got heard in a lot of areas. And we found out that uh, Alanis Morissette had picked up the album and, and put it towards um, this committee of, of judges saying it was one of her favourite albums of the year. We knew we'd made a little dent on the music scene, on the college radio scene, like, you know, so, you know, it was kind of mission, mission accomplished, really. We're back in JFK Airport. We've done five and a half weeks. We're knackered. Um, people are starting to dress like us already, so I think it's time to leave. Matches run out on the phone. Um, spent all our money. We had a brilliant time. Um, I think we're superstars now. So, uh, can't talk to you anymore. So this is how it ends Man against machine It's the finest fist fight The world has ever seen You should have stayed at home But your loyalty is torn Living after midnight Rocking till the dawn Sitting at your throne Looking mighty brave If you leave me alone I'll jump into your grave Times have change Just around the bend This is how it ends
about to change just around the bend this is how it ends right where we began this is how it ends